So welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us again for another fabulous event during our National Accessibility Digital Conference. Um, today, I'm gathered with a few fantastic people to have a really great, important conversation about uh, disclosing and self-identifying in the workplace and kind of rebuilding that trust a little bit. I know uh, in the past, there's been a lot of negative um, negative responses and feedback to people actually, you know, taking that brave step and, and um, having a conversation with somebody to tell them something very vulnerable about themselves. And we as a society are hoping to move forward and, and, and kind of change that conversation a little bit. Before we get started, I'm just going to do a, a land acknowledgement and then we'll have a little introduction of our, our panelists today. So we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are honored to work and serve on this land. We stand with the protesters across Canada and the globe, demanding an end to racism, discrimination, and violence. We acknowledge the deep and powerful challenges faced by all marginalized communities in Nova Scotia, Canada, and beyond. So if it's okay with you all, we'll just, like I say, just uh, start with a quick introduction of yourselves and a little bit about your role uh, in the organization you're with, and, and that'll help us gauge the, the perspective of the conversation you're bringing to the table today. So Travis, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Sure thing. So um, I'm Travis Woodworth, and I work with the Native Council of Nova Scotia. Uh, we're known as NCNS, and you're going to love our acronyms. So within NCNS, I work for APTAC, which is the Aboriginal Peoples uh, technical uh, and Education Commission. Underneath that, my role lies with ACEDA, which is the Aboriginal Connections in Trade and Apprenticeship. A lot of letters, a lot of numbers. Well, essentially what this means is I work with clients when it, they're considering a career with trades. Um, we do exploration, we do um, supports, and we do education, mentoring, and navigation. Um, which is the assessment of strengths, struggles, and uh, making sure people have everything they require to be successful in the trades. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And Matthias, over to you. Thank you. My name is Matthias Dernford. I'm uh, the VP of HR at Farnell Packaging. We're a Nova Scotia-based business. We work out of uh, Burnside. Uh, we produce flexible packaging, so think food packaging, French fry bags, even things like diaper bags. Uh, our products are on many of the grocery store shelves across North America. My role within the company is to oversee the HR department, provide support to the supervisors and managers that we have on site, and be the connection to the outside community as well. And I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Matthias. And Maram. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, so I'm the Success40 uh, program facilitator at Reachability. Um, and Success40 or S40 is an eight-week employability program where we do the first four weeks uh, of online classes. Uh, so we explore things like uh, skills and communication. Uh, we also do resumes and cover letters. Uh, we also talk about expectations uh, and how to survive the first week um, on, on the work site. Excellent. Thank you. And as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, this, this conversation is going to be kind of based around uh, rebuilding that trust a little bit and talking about disclosure and self-identification. And I think in order to really be able to start the conversation, we need to just start right there. What do those terms mean to each of you as, as an individual? It could be um, yourselves uh, maybe facing having a disability or, um, you know, as a professional in your position. So if it's okay, again, we'll just go around the table and, and maybe this time we'll start with Matthias. Yeah, sure. I, I looked at this question in two ways. I think one is an individual and then second from my professional opinion. Um, so, you know, I think disclosure self-identification describes sharing sometimes very private personal information as a means of, you know, making an employer aware of specific hurdles that may require a different perspective on, on what I'm facing. But I think the key to that is sharing very private personal information uh, with uh, with someone who otherwise wouldn't ask, need, or, or uh, want that information? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And from an employer perspective, um, it describes uh, an employee or candidate or a partner sharing information that will support their ability to complete the position details. 
um, disclosure for me opens up a conversation about uh, how we can, uh, you know, look at a situation and make modifications if those are required, or at least just have a conversation about how things might be able to change, be adjusted or recognized uh, to, to allow for, you know, a, a seamless transition into our workplace or to continue on with working in the organization. Excellent. Thank you. And Travis, how about you? What do those terms mean to you? So disclosure, it depends on what, what uh, decade you're asking me at. At 90s, that meant um, really just keeping my, my information close to the chest. I didn't want anyone to know I was Native. I'm, I look the way I do. And sometimes it's beneficial not to, uh, not to disclose. Same, with, same thing with my hearing and my speech impediment. I spent a lot of time over the years kind of working on those things to uh, not hide them, but make sure they're not very noticeable. In the, the early 2000s, same sort of story, but we see the growth of acceptance and diversification of workplaces and hiring practices and training methodologies. Um, now we're looking at a whole different world where diversity and inclusion are not just nice things to have, but almost requirements at a lot of job places. And I think... Um, the term dis disclosure has changed through all those kind of eras. Um, today, I would say disclosure is important when it comes to just uh, anything relevant to your job, anything that might get in your way of the career path. Uh, open and honest conversation is really the best bet, in my opinion, to move forward. But there are, of course, some hangups, knowing what's appropriate, what's required, and what's needed. Those are conversations that definitely mo need more time. And I think that's uh, what uh, events like this are allowing us to do. Absolutely. And, and that's really important that, that you mentioned that there's a lot of, a lot of uh, really important things we should share. And there are things that maybe aren't relevant to share and, and understanding the difference between some of those things can be really helpful in making this conversation a little more um, digestible for people and a little bit more safe for them as well. And Maram, how about you? What's your perspective on those terms? Well, from my personal perspective, I mean, uh, disclosure means, you know, telling the potential employer about your disability or your condition uh, or self-identifying. Um, and like what Matthias said, you know, you are putting yourself in a vulnerable spot. You are uh, giving away uh, some private information. Um, but to me, you know, over time, uh, the word disclosure really did change. It's, it's more than just revealing a disability uh, or a condition or an illness. Uh, it's, you know, disclosure is also an opportunity and it's an opportunity to bring out your strengths, uh, your skills, your talents, and, you know, the values that you bring to the workforce. And also when I think of the word disclosure, I think of the word courage. Uh, and it's the courage to be more open about your disability, uh, to be frank about it, uh, and to have the courage to represent others uh, with disabilities as well. Excellent, thank you, I really appreciate that. Even those answers were very, you know, quite vulnerable. You, you all had to sort of dig a little deep on those ones. So I appreciate that you're able to, to share openly and, uh, and honestly with us in that perspective. Um, so for, for my next question, I, I'm wondering, like, what would be the purpose of, of asking somebody to disclose or self-identify? You, you, you all kind of touched on a little bit on how that could, you know, benefit a person. But, but let's, like, really dig into that and, and use some specific examples, if we can, of how that can help um, either people who are applying for positions or clients that we're working with. And uh, I'm not sure if anyone in particular wants to start or I can ask someone. Um, I can start off with a pretty, sure. pretty um, I would say, uh, common issue right now when we're looking at safety considerations at, for job development and education uh, training. Um, disabilities, the disclosure of that can really allow trainers and the managers to really focus and um, customize training and even workstations to ensure that those are properly supported. That uh, if something of the common kind of construct of the workplace um, process isn't really fitting the bill by disclosing it, anything that does not work in, that's caused by disability or any other sort of confidential information, you're really opening up a conversation how you can improve that job as an organization for people with, who face issues with its current configuration. If it's not known, no one's going to really approach it and rectify it. So it's one of those things by being vulnerable um, and disclosing that information, you may be improving not only your station, but the station of others with similar situations. Excellent, thank you, Travis. 
I think I think that's a really great point, Travis, that people often overlook is that, you know, the, the, the conversations that folks are having today may have a lasting impact for, for the other people that are coming behind them or that are walking right alongside them. Um, another piece that, uh, you know, I think is really important is job satisfaction as well. Um, you know, I think it's really important uh, that that disclosure conversation can happen safely to have a positive impact on someone's satisfaction in the position because there are uh, certainly hurdles that can that can create those environments where someone may be you know really struggling and that and that has an impact on their mental health Definitely. Um, Matthias, I would really have to agree with you right there. I mean, ultimately, you know, uh, the purpose of disclosure is to allow the job seeker to actually request reasonable accommodation. But, you know, according to a lot of my clients, they they're looking for something else. And, you know, that that includes the opportunity to educate uh, the employer uh, uh, regarding their, their health condition and, you know, addressing their concerns and uh, so that the employer would have a better idea and a better understanding of what's going on and what they're dealing with. Um, and also clients would like um, more involvement of employers uh, in terms of developing um, of accommodations uh, as well. So they really want them to say, OK, here's what we can do as a team. Uh, you know, do you have any more ideas of, of how we can come up with better accommodations? And also, it, ultimately, it really does save the client from having to use that uh, physical and mental uh, energy uh, in, in trying to hide or protect uh, their disability. So if everything is out there on the table, uh, you know, they have no fear in the end. So, so we're almost talking about it as in like a proactive approach to be able to, to have a, a confidence going into it. Uh, most people know they're capable of doing the work, but they may have this little piece of something holding them back in some capacity. And, and like Maram said, instead of trying to hide that or kind of uh, fluff through it a little bit, just knowing that they can have the support from the employer is, is one, less stress, and two, is actually they may be able to provide something to make that um, you know, task a little bit easier for them. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that, that you all touched on those pieces. Um, that's awesome. And when, when we think about it in terms of like, um, Travis, in, in your work, like there's, there's people coming in, um, you know, we kind of touched a little bit on, on some, some things with um, uh, like education online now and, and what that might look like and fears and, and um, that alone is holding people back. So, so how could that conversation help somebody in that capacity? Um, so if you're looking at schools, a lot of them are still reeling from the COVID situation, the, how the pandemic's really changed us from a in-person uh, brick and mortar school system to a virtual. And they're still learning lessons. They're still learning lessons on learning styles. Um, we're going back to the visual audio type based hearing. We're looking at uh, infrastructure and all kinds of things where the, the playing field's not even for everybody. And so when it comes to education, we're still learning, but one thing that's going to happen is we're going to see a more even playing field that does use technological advantages um, and platforms that allows everyone to access it to their best ability. Uh, uh, so education, when it comes to schools, yeah, we're going to see a lot more technological adaptation, adoption of new platforms. But when it comes to the workplace, we're going to be looking at how these approaches worked in schools can be brought to frontline education. Um, and I think there's just a lot of lessons to be learned. I'm not certainly an expert in any of this. I'm just kind of seeing how it's playing out by being the frontline kind of advocate for safety and for training. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing that a lot of people are adopting these and it's being successful for a lot, a varied uh, group of clients. Um, again, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes forward. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, I plan to keep working with it. Yes, exactly. And, and encouraging our, our um, clients and job seekers to keep kind of being able to be flexible and, and roll with those kind of, um, you know, new things as well. And, and it's, it's a whole opens a whole new world for, for asking for accommodation or talking about, you know, disclosing information about ourselves because it's, you know, technology is not everybody's best friend. And so, so that on its own is a barrier for a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. regardless if you are experiencing any type of disability and, and adding that extra layer is just, uh, you know, it's terrifying for some people. 
I think with every new technology, there's a dark side that we've got to be really aware of and how that might have an impact. And there's certainly a lot of positives that we can draw from the pandemic and the move to virtual. But I think we need to be really careful that we're looking at all those perspectives before we dive in with both feet and maybe, you know, cherry picking the things that are really working for for everyone and, and not just the, the the ones that are working for some. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, uh, I would, oh, this is a good one. So we kind of talked about this a little bit uh, already in terms of like what, what might be appropriate and what, what might not be appropriate. So I'd like to take a look at boundaries for just a moment and what would be appropriate uh, to ask an employer or service provider and what is inappropriate to share? Like what, what is it okay for an employer to, to ask in terms of, you know, them wanting you to disclose something and, and what is it what is it appropriate for a person to respond with? Uh, maybe I'll jump in does uh, you, know, you know it was a it was a I spent a lot of time looking at this question and and I still find it even now a bit disheartening that we're asking it that we have to ask it to, in general. Um, I think to answer the question, I mean anything that's going to have an impact on you know the position itself and and the job is where you know that line gets drawn and then beyond that from my perspective it's it's private information and that's uh, that's up to the individual if they if they choose and if it's if it's relevant even um, I guess what I found disheartening was you know I, when I took my training in HR it it seemed like there were guardrails and there were clear guardrails that um, the industry and best practice is formulating. But then you launch out into the real world and there's such a wide scope um, with how employers are, you know, interpreting or even acknowledging that these guardrails are there. And, and that, that's been really disheartening for me, uh, you know, as I, as I find my way into, into the industry. Um, you know, what I, what I challenge everyone, you know, I, I find that all employers understand their duties related to statutory holidays, for example, but yet there's this, you know, question mark around, uh, you know, all these other important areas. And I, I just find that incredible that we still have that conversation today. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm just going to jump in right there too, as well. You know, I think from a client perspective, really, um, it's as, as sad it is to say to them, you know, uh, when you when you look at it uh, in terms of disclosure and what's appropriate to, to disclose, I tell them remember you know the potential employer is not your therapist. Um, ha I've had a lot of clients who have told me many stories about how they say, well, I disclosed one thing, and then I disclosed another thing, and then I disclosed everything, and I never got the, that call back, uh, which is really really sad. But um, you know, the my I think my my ultimate uh, tip here is to kind of decide on uh, beforehand on what to say and how to say it, um, and provide only as much information as that uh, employer needs uh, for you to get the accommodation. Uh, so what's you know what's appro appropriate to disclose? Well, you know, don't tell like, your life history. Uh, for example, if if you have Crohn's um, and you know you you're asking for accommodations. Uh, it's 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 good to say and it's appropriate to say I will be needing more frequent bathroom breaks, uh, but you don't need to get into the details of why you need to go to the bathroom so many times. Uh, so it's you know it's it's still pretty tough to kind of uh, for the class to determine really what is appropriate and what is not. Uh, and like you said, Matthias, there are so many things uh, in front of us right there, you know, in, in terms of what's appropriate and what what is not. We really still uh, have that problem kind of uh, distinguishing between that. It's also, you know, I, I don't want to speak on, you know, for other people, but, you know, I, I, I hear it on a regular basis that, you know, folks have have had really bad experiences with employers or really bad experiences in the interview and application process. And it causes them to, uh, to, to you know, to, to your point, um, Aram, to second guess, you know, what they're even what they're even uh, bringing up in the first place. And that that uh, I find that very painful that uh, others are experiencing that. I know, Travis, I think you were trying to say something there. I saw your mute going. <laughs> There's always a fear that um, they might, employers might think you're unsuitable for the position when you do disclose. So it does, again, lead to this uncertainty of what should be disclosed. You might very well have a condition that with just very standard um, supports might be like assuaged completely in the job. But due to that kind of uncertainty, you might not disclose information at all just because you're so uncertain you're you 
just so uncertain and you really want that job. So you don't tell them and it's really harming everyone in that process without kind of clear communications and expectations. I see that being a huge issue in most trades, most trade uh, careers as well. So, so um, would we say it's fair when we're thinking about participants or job seekers going to uh, disclose some information? Maram, you kind of touched on it, and it's it's like, how is this going to impact my job? And Matthias, maybe you can talk to this too. I know in specific job descriptions, it, it will say, you know, these are the tasks and responsibilities that you're responsible for. And so, would it be appropriate then for somebody to look at those very specific roles that they would have and, and think like, what 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 would my disability um, prevent me from being able to do in this capacity? And, and is there a way that I can say, yes, this might be a barrier for me in terms of this specific task, but here's what I would need in order to um, be successful there. Is it, is it as simple as just looking at the very specific details and that's it, just leave it at the bare minimum? Or is it more like, yes, I have a disability. Can we talk about it once, once we move forward a little more? Or like, how, how would we address that kind of conversation I think it's a in an interview? I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's not just a matter of looking at a job posting and saying, I can do this, I can do that, and then putting them to two different um, sections and then saying, let's have a conversation. It's really all about how, you know, how much success can you have in, in that job and what, what do you need to succeed? If you do have a disability that does prevent you from doing that uh, specific role or job, uh, it is best to have that in-depth conversation with uh, the employer so that, you, so that you're both on the same page and you're both aware uh, of the limitations that you have and, and what you can do to kind of overcome those barriers. So yeah, it is, it's, it's a lot more than just looking at a job posting and, and just kind of having a small conversation about that. And, and yeah, I, would, I, sorry, go I, ahead, I was going to say, I would, I would agree with that. I think that, that, you know, I, I know that's not what you were trying to do, Carrie, to simplify that, but I, but I know that, I, I, that is actually, I, I, I want to make sure people understand it. And also it's not so, it's everybody's different. So it, it does yeah. depend on the situation. So yeah, add, add on that complex layer of a wide scope of how employers are going to respond in that situation. You've got yourself a really complex question. And I think that that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why we're here today to have a conversation about this. But, you know, I, I, I certainly would, um, you know, value and appreciate a conversation early on. And then, you know, uh, we, we do a job shadow here, which I think is really important to get somebody familiar with what the position is. We run through it. It typically takes about four hours. And then at that point, we can have another discussion about it just to see if there's any additional feedback and then make any modifications. The other piece is, you know, I think employers have a, a responsibility to be flexible as well. I, you know, a lot, I see a lot of employers who, you know, they've got their job posting or their job description and, and they don't, they don't stray from that. You know, if you, if you can do it great, if you can't, well, that's, you know, that unfortunately that's not the position for you. And, and that's not the approach uh, that we need to be taking. Uh, it's, it's gotta be flexible. It's gotta be, uh, there's gotta be dialogue. There's gotta be, a, it's gotta be a two-way street. That, that's exactly how I was hoping you would address that, Matthias. So, and that's exactly it. It's it's not it's not black and white. It's not simple. It's not a matter of just looking at a simple line and saying yay or nay to something or here's a little piece of information. It's it's a very complex conversation, and and you've all touched it very very closely already. That it's it's a big layered conversation, and it's a lot of it's a lot of vulnerability on a person's part, and a lot of fear. You know that that you say the one wrong thing, and you're just not going to get that job. And so the responsibility isn't always just on the, the job seeker or the, the participant, it's it's on the employer being flexible and, and being willing to open their, their sort of field a little bit and, and be flexible and have a bigger conversation about the positive things. I mean, a lot of the conversation is not about disability, but ability and what is it that I can do and what is it that I can bring to this conversation. So being able to, to take it from that perspective and kind of open the door a little bit more, I think is very important for employers just to help build that trust a little bit. And, and that's kind of what we're here for is to, to open that up and, and say, let's look at it from a different perspective. So thank you very much for that, that response, Matthias. And um, I don't know, uh, Travis, if you have anything that you wanna to add to that as well. Um, there's not too much more to cover really. It's just uh, again, going back to safety, we plan jobs around being as safe as possible. And um, generally disability is not included into that sort of planning. And so disclosure again, allows that to be included into safe work procedures. 
So beyond just the hiring process, but doing the job, the taskings alone. Um, yeah, again, an honest conversation and a, a workplace that does have that conversation, like they facilitate that. Yeah, that's going to probably be the most effective path of, of, of dealing with disability, ability and um, accommodation. Mm -hmm. And you bring up a very valid point there, Travis. I know in, in the trades specifically, safety is a huge issue. And, you know, there's a lot of expectation that people need to be at a certain level in order to be able to meet those safety standards and um, that there's not a lot of give and take there. And so that that conversation is hard to make more flexible, but it, it does need to happen. And, and I don't know if you see those changes kind of coming to fruition or happening yet, or if it's a kind of a slow process in that field. It's a slow, slow process, though there are, is work being done towards it. We're including more technology into uh, taskings, uh, new tools that uh, reduce, that remove trades from the old masculine. You must swing the 60 pound hammer all day long, which does limit who can take that job. We're looking at other ta uh, tools and technological advantages to really make that job more um, inclusive to everybody. Um, from the six foot three, 270 pound bench presser to um, <laughs> To um, a 120-pound uh, woman, they should all be able to do that job now because it's m moving away from good old muscle power towards technological advantage. And uh, you see that in most trades. That's very encouraging to hear. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think uh, I think along the same conversation is, you know, uh, Matthias, you said it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that we have to have this sort of conversation about boundaries and, and whatnot. As, a, as an employer, when you're looking at equi equitable hires, is, is there fear there? Is there, is there uncertainty and, and um, you know, just not knowing what path to take or what those guardrails, safe rails look like? How does that look for, for you as an employer? Yeah, I, I mean, I think anytime you are a bit vulnerable, it's, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you've got to be more aware of that. Um, from a hiring perspective, you know, we're more concerned with, you know, how, if we're casting our net wide enough, for example, that, you know, we recognize some of the biases that we bring to the table in the HR department, and we try to, uh, we try to approach those. Um, I think that, you know, from, you uh, you know, from a hiring supervisor perspective, there's certainly some reluctance about lines of questioning and things like that, that um, create an environment where someone may be apprehensive to jump in with proper coaching, a bit of training and, you know, uh, the right person or people in your corner. I think that any supervisor can navigate those just fine. And, uh, you know, oftentimes mileage is, is really all that it takes. So, I mean, from our perspective, and, and we certainly recognize we've got a lot of work left to do, you know, our, our major concern from, uh, from an equitable hiring perspective is wh where do our biases limit us and how can we cast our net wider than we already are? And, and, you know, one of the, the, one of the relationships that I'm so fond of is that with uh, the reachability group, because it's a safe place for someone like myself or my colleague, Nikki, to be able to pick up the phone and say, Hey, you know, we've got this question. I need your help just sort of navigating this. Can you give me your advice there? And that, that for us has been, has been fantastic. Just having that safe place to be able to ask those types of questions. And I really appreciate that. I know that you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, education on a lot of people's place, uh, um, it places to, to happen still. And so to be able to acknowledge that that's part of the process and, and to be continually learning and, and striving to do better in those areas is, is, is wonderful to hear. And, and like you said, reachability is a really great, great place to get some of that education and training. And we, we do, obviously I'm not, I'm not promoting us, but I am, we do have some really great opportunities to be able to help people, you know, figure out if they're, if they're headed down the right path or not. So I appreciate that you mentioned that, and I'm glad that it's been successful for you. And, and I kind of asked the same question in on the other end of the table there with when we're looking at clients and, and people that are wanting to participate in, in programs and whatnot, you know, what are, what are some of their fears? Uh, uh, I think we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but I think it's important to, to really bring it to light that this is this is pretty serious for a lot of people. Maram, do you, do you want to touch on that? Uh, definitely, Carrie. So, I mean, from a client perspective, really, disclosure to begin with is very, very risky. It's not fun. Uh, you're giving away um, very private information, and it just it just depends on what the uh, the employer how they react uh, and how they act. Um, and we also know that not all employers are informed or open minded uh, to disclosure. So, um, some of the fears that our clients kind of 
uh, mentioned were uh, a negative reaction uh, or response from a potential employer. I mean, the employer right away ne uh, reacts negatively. They don't know what to, what to say. It's a shock to them. Um, and also being treated and looked at differently, uh, either because of uh, visible disabilities uh, or uh, an invisible disability that has been announced. Um, and I mean, in terms of being judged, discriminated, misunderstood uh, for who they are and who they identify as uh, is another uh, big barrier and another big fear that uh, many of my clients uh, have. Um, and, you know, also many of my clients say that they're not seen as being able to do the job just like others, and they are seen as being less valuable, uh, which is really sad because then the focus becomes on the disability itself rather than the abilities uh, of clients. Um, and, you know, if an, and they, you know, a lot of clients have said, if the employer is unwilling or is unable to accommodate me, I may just be screened out. And they just lose that on that chance of being able to get that job as well. Um, and also, you know, with the employer having a lack of faith in the abilities and the skills uh, of the clients as well really does have a very, very negative impact on the client's self-esteem as well. Um, and, you know, a lot of clients say, well, what if my employer thinks that my accommodation will be costly? Mm -hmm. That's another big fear that they might have. Uh, and and that's, that's, I think, one of the biggest reasons that um, a lot of my clients actually don't disclose is because they know they need accommodation, uh, for example, software or, or, or something, um, certain technology uh, or certain tools to be able to do their job well. And they're very, very afraid of disclosing because they think they're not, they're not going to be able to get accommodated uh, because it's going to cost the employer quite a bit as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Travis? What about you? What do you see from your perspective dealing with the, the individuals that you deal with? Um, again, it's a lot of my clients, they, they vary in age and um, experience. And um, when it comes to anyone in their 20s and 30s, they've been going through their life with their disabilities or uh, their racial identity through, throughout. And they've already have a coping mechanism in place. And it's as far as they're aware, it's worked for them. And so when it comes to clients breaking whatever they used to have to kind of approach new workplaces, if that's what's required, that's where I find the most hesitancy. Um, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a rock star client that I really appreciate working with. Um, and he wanted to go into the trades, one with a particular high uh, barrier when it comes to math. And uh, his particular circumstance, um, Prevented really high um, math uh, retention when it comes to just straight arithmetic. And he was always afraid to approach his trade because of that. Without realizing that when you're in the field, you're actually not using math in the same way you're using it in school. So there's, there's a disconnect between practice and theory. Um, and that's where I have a lot of my uh, contention with just really showing the clients that yeah no the school's going to be a little painful but we have supports and and, and people in place to help you organize specific to your situation to get through that and then you're in the field and it's different and you, it it's hard to explain because that's an experience based component i can't take what i've experienced and put it directly in their head they got to take my word for it and that's the scariest bit and my hardest part or hardest sell when it comes to certain grades mm -hmm. So um, that's, and again, their hesitancy because they're not seeing the trade, they're seeing uh, the school uh, requirements to take the course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's difficult. Yeah, and very similar to, to people uh, looking at jobs and thinking, I can't do this, I can't do that, same barriers there. And so, uh, Matthias, I'm not sure if you have more to add. I just wanted to mention that I, I appreciate that, um, Maram, you're able to kind of um, talk about some of the, the fears that the clients have and also Matthias, when we look at the employer and say like they're doing education to get to where they need to be in order to be, you know, more open and understanding and be more flexible. And that's what, the, that's what our clients are asking for is for them to be able to do that. And I think that's really important to mention in this conversation because in order to be able to move forward and, and make positive changes, it's on both parties. We both have to have that, that uh, give and take and there has to be that confidence on both sides to be able to have these really, really uncomfortable sometimes conversations and uncomfortable in terms of 
you know, the, the job seeker or the participant, it's very vulnerable for them. Also for the employer, uncomfortable because they don't want to say the wrong thing or, or make them feel uncomfortable. And so I think we're seeing more and more of that. And I, and I really hope that we keep going in that direction in terms of the employers. I know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an upward battle and I think we're, you know, we're all here to help push those things out of the way and hopefully, hopefully make some, some changes in a positive direction. Yeah, I was. Um, I, I agree with you, and I and I think that when you think about the the fact that this is oftentimes the first time the two people are meeting, and then they're diving into this extremely personal conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, that's uh, it's it's nothing to just shake a stick at. But what I was going to say was just to thank Travis for mentioning the, you know, the different generations and how they have developed coping skills. One thing I've been very surprised about um, is. You know, we've got an organization that has a lot of, uh, you know, long tenured employees, and I have seen many who have been here 10, 20, even 30 years that are only just now raising, um, you know, considerations that they have about disclosure related to disclosure. And, um, you know, one side of me is, is very happy that they're able to do that, they feel safe to do that. But the other side of me feels, again, sad that they have managed or have had to cope with that for, you know, a number of years. And um, yeah, so thanks, Travis, for mentioning that. No problem. It's uh, something even in, like my, my short lifespan, I've had to go through myself just because the, the climate of the disability and disclosures changed so rapidly in the past, I say 30 years, but my you know it's again experience base other people have different perspectives and that's kind of the hard part of it it's a perspective and experience based yeah for sure couldn't agree more yeah okay so I really like this question because I'm hoping it's going to be very positive and a lot of really great um you know, a motivation for people. And so that is, what is one piece of advice you would give to a person that maybe has experienced previous discrimination by an employer or a potential employer when they're thinking about disclosing moving forward? It's, there's been a lot of, we've talked a lot of negativity in the past, things, have, things are starting to slowly change, but, but what's a piece of advice that you might give to somebody, Matthias? Yeah, I, I, again, I spent a lot of time thinking about this question. And, you know, I, I think what I landed on was, you know, if I was speaking to someone who had been, you know, had a bad experience, um, you know, I've met, a, I've met a fair number of bad people in the world, and that doesn't necessarily tell me that all human beings are bad people. Um, with that said, I understand that that has an extremely personal impact, and I would not want to have someone, you know, um, be exposed to that again. So, you know, th- there are a number of things that, you know, someone could look for in an employer to make sure that they operate with integrity. Again, it's unfortunate that we even have to have that conversation. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, you know, you know, the, the one piece would probably be, you know, give it another chance, you know, maybe do a little bit of homework to make sure that the folks you're going to see are aware of their duties. And, and then, uh, and then uh, you know, not, don't be afraid to open yourself up again. Uh, not, not all people are bad, even though there are some out there that are, that are. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, Maram, do you wanna go next? Yeah, um, so, you know, interviews are very stressful to begin with, and we, we all know that, but, you know, having to disclose really can make things even more stressful. So, um, but let's think about this. The opportunity of employment should not over, overshadow the importance of human rights uh, as well. I mean, you know, I I do agree with Matthias, you know, not all employers are bad, uh, not all employers are negative. uh, And even uh, if uh, a client did have or a job seeker did have um, uh, a negative uh, experience with an employer by being discriminated against, uh, it's not going to be always this way. Uh, You know, uh, they may be facing uh, better situations uh, in the future. But I just want the client uh, or the job seeker to kind of look at it this way as well. At the end of the interview, uh, they should recognize that an interview is actually reflective of the company's work environment and culture as well. So I want them to ask themselves uh, at the end of the day, are they worth the, uh, their time and their energy and their talents if they did discriminate against you, um, you know, before hiring you to begin with? So that's just a question that I want the client or the job seeker to think about. But I also want them to think about that, 
you know, not everything is negative and not every single interview uh, is going to come out to be uh, a very negative experience. You will have positive experiences. It's just a matter of finding the right employer for, for the and the right position that fits you and your abilities. Excellent. And, and that lines up quite nicely with what Matthias was just saying as well, really, you know, making sure that you're, you're looking at the employer and is, is this an employer that, that I feel shares the same values as me and, and do I feel like I would really fit in here? So sometimes it's, it's not just looking at the job, but it's actually looking at the employer and, and recognizing that this, this could be a really good fit based on the fact that we have the same values and the integrity of the employer is there. And that's, that's a wonderful way to look at it. And uh, Travis, how about you? Well, it just kind of goes on to echo what the, the two have just already said, um, making sure that the workplace is worth working for. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel like you've been discriminated or held back before because of any reason, it shows that maybe there's issues that are going to go beyond that. Um, if you're even to get in, um, are they, if they don't care at the door, are they going to care when you're in the door? Um, so we're looking at safety, we're looking at job progression, we're looking at job satisfaction and dignity on the work site. Um, if you feel it's like a bad day, if you have red flags off the bat, it's probably good to pull it, like to call it off off the bat. Mm -hmm. And I, I treat workplaces the same way. That's a red flag. And for me, I would not want to work for a place that I felt that sort of um, anxiety with, um, not for long term. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that advice from everybody. And, and you know, it, it's kind of hard because it's easy for us to sit here and say these things. And, and when it comes down to it, when, you know, sense of urgency is there and people are, are really desperate for a job or they really need to get back in the workforce. Sometimes we don't have that option. We don't have the ability to pick and choose the employers that we're working for. And, and I, and I really, you know, that's a call out to employers to, to hopefully, you know, do the steps that they need to do in order to get to a place where people do feel like they, they are, you know, a, a valuable employer and, and people actually want to, you know, be there and work there. So it's, again, that, that everybody needs to be doing a little bit of, of upping the ante to, to make this a better, a better situation for everyone. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe just look at uh, a couple of scenarios. And, and we've talked a lot about, you know, things that could go wrong or, or the negative impact on it. But does anybody have a positive story that they could share where they were involved with somebody disclosing some information and it was a really great experience for them and, and things went well and, and it, it can show, you know, taking that leap of faith in, in, in somebody is, is a good step. And this is maybe why. Yeah, um, so I'd like to start. So I do have a scenario where um, a client did uh, disclose to me that has happened and ended in a positive way. So uh, this person, uh, you know, did uh, obtain a job at a very busy and noisy um, office environment, and they did have uh, severe anxiety disorder. Um, so uh, we, you know, we, when we talked about it, you know, we know that in order to do their well job, uh, their job really well, they needed to be very organized. Um, they needed to be able to plan, uh, which was very important for the job itself. And they needed to be able to manage the time and, and handling stress as well. Uh, so they weren't really doing really well with it. So uh, it was necessary for them to disclose uh, to their employer that they did have uh, an anxiety disorder uh, and both did work on uh, ideas for accom accommodations. So, uh, I mean, this person did really well eventually because they were able to get a, a modified uh, break schedule. Uh, uh, they were able to get one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, from, uh, you know, within the company itself. Uh, and they did have private space to kind of calm down when they had an anxiety attack. Uh, and they had things uh, such as, uh, noise cancellation headsets uh, to use when necessary as well. So bottom line, uh, with the work that uh, the uh, the job uh, or the employee and the employer worked together, uh, they were able to come up with very, very uh, good accommodations and, and the whole situation just came out to be very, very positive, uh, which really does kind of uh, send a little bit of beacon of hope for uh, for other job seekers like that. I mean, it's not always negative and it does have to be this way. Thank you. I appreciate that. Travis or Matthias? Yeah, I can I can share. I was um, I just reflecting. We've actually got a, a it's fairly recent and, and it's one of our uh, longer term employees. This, this individual has been with us for over 20 years and uh, we've been doing more 
reading in our leadership groups. So we meet weekly with these groups and, and uh, we've been adding some new reading material. And this person approached me in a confidential capacity and explained that um, he, he has always had a challenge uh, reading and he wasn't really sure what the, the basis for that was and we supported him with the sort of acute question. And it turns out that he uh, has uh, dyslexia and uh, that has been a source of pain for him unknowingly. He, he uh, has had a, always had a challenge with emails and keeping up with emails and, and staying on top of those things. And now that he's able to understand uh, what this, uh, what the disability or superpower, depending on how you look at it is, um, you know, he, I, I can see, you know, he's, he's almost a different person just from a, you know, from a, from a, an engagement perspective, it's been really cool to be part of that and to, uh, to be supporting, uh, that person with that. So that, that I would think that would be the most, uh, the most recent case for me and it's still live. We're still, uh, we're still supporting that person today. So. Excellent. Thank you. And Travis. Yeah. Um, so. In uh, one of my jobs, I work with a curing, um, autoclaving. We produce the aircraft parts and uh, we deal with a lot of chemicals. Um, I had a, a coworker who uh, began to have rashes from one of the chemicals. It's uh, called sensitization uh, originally. It stuff didn't bother him, but over time, cumulative effect started bothering him. And um, he's really weirded out, didn't know if he was supposed to approach supervision, afraid that he'd lose the position. Um, he did approach them and they, they addressed it right away. So workplaces are really growing and developing to ensure that people are comfortable where they're working. Even if you already had the job and had it for years, if conditions change, it's, you need to still have a new conversation if it's affecting you. Um, my coworker, he's retrained given a job that he was interested in for a while. Um, and I think, I think if he hadn't gone forward, he could put himself at risk. And so um, there, there was a real safety issue there that was um, also alleviated just from honest conversation. Um, again, that's, that's going to be my honest advice is honest conversations and mm -hmm. that uh, workplaces are growing to appreciate and protect people when it comes to those. And I think that's quite relevant. Uh, you know, we kind of, we kind of touched on that. Uh, Matthias, you had mentioned that, you know, there's, there's people that have been in, in your organization for 10 or 15 years, and you had no idea that this was a thing for them. Um, we talk, we've talked a lot already about what that first initial conversation and, you know, kind of address it as soon as possible and have an open conversation. But what about people in that case? Like, what about people who have been at the job for a long time? And, and how do you approach that conversation? Who do you talk to? How do you make that like a, a comfortable situation when you could be worried about losing your job because something has changed. I think that's on the employer to create an environment where the person knows that it's a safe space. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that if someone's been working in a job for 10 or 15 years and they didn't feel comfortable disclosing, uh, albeit the industry's changing, you know, society's changing, but what, what has changed from an employer perspective that would now make it safe for them to do that? So the onus, I think, is on the employer in that case. Um, that's through, you know, communications and messages. And, um, you know, uh, one thing I think that, that has changed internally is how we are approaching, you know, job seekers and the people that are here are seeing how we're approaching job seekers and therefore it's showing them or, or articulating to them that it's, this is different. It's, just, it's a different environment now and, and it may be safer today to speak up than it, than it has been. I'm not suggesting that Fairdale was an unsafe place to work, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, but the environment's changed and that, that the, you know, that the safety of that space has changed. I hope that answers your question. I sort of went off on a bit of a tangent there. No, it, it really does. And I think, I think that's important. It's, it's being able to um, it kind of lead by example and, and, and show that, that these things are happening. And the only way you can do that is by communicating uh, amongst your team and, you know, in newsletters and, and um, group conversations, meetings, whatever. And, and like you said, pe people being able to see, you know, this is the way, this is the way that, that we're hiring now. And these are the, these are the things we're doing for the people we're bringing on. And we, we value them right from the beginning. And we also value you. We've had you here for years and years, and we want to make sure that you know that we value you and your, your conversation as well. So I think that was a, a, a fantastic answer. And Maram, uh, I know uh, it's it's not quite in, in the list of questions I had, but 
but very similar, like what kind of advice might you give to, to clients or job seekers that are in that position or, or maybe worried, like if I don't disclose right away and it's something that will affect me later, you know, it could be, could be something like anxiety or depression and it's not there, it's managed right now. And do I really need to mention that to my employer where it's not going to affect anything, but maybe six, six months down the road, you know, my, my anxiety strikes up and, and how do I have that conversation? Yeah, uh, so Carrie, really, I do think that communication is key, exactly like what Matthias had said. Um, and, you know, in the client perspective, I really would advise them to use very common words rather than medical terms when, when they're talking to uh, the employer, when it's time to talk uh, to them, uh, should your condition get worse, or if you are diagnosed with a new condition. Um, you know, take the time to educate them about your disability. I mean, you don't have to disclose everything, but you, you know, you should disclose things that are going to be very necessary for you to get that accommodation. Um, and, you know, also tell them, you know, what accommodations have you been utilizing and what works for you? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it glasses for uh, light sensitivity? Is it a chair for a bad back? Uh, is, it a, is it a software that you can use that is low cost? Yeah, you know, ultimately you want this to be educational and not a burden on the employer. We know that employers do have that responsibility to be uh, welcoming and to be, uh, you know, inclusive of everybody. Uh, but ultimately we do want this to be educational and, and not uh, very scary for the employer. Um, and, you know, do come, you know, communicate solutions and ideas on how you can, boot, you know, how you can best do your job um, and come up with uh, low cost or no cost accommodations uh, if you can, along with the employer. Uh, I think that makes things much, much easier on both sides um, if they work together this way. I agree. Travis, anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, uh, safety works in a very similar fashion. Um, no cost or low cost solutions to ensure that everyone's included. Um, I think that's probably the best way of handling. Um, just an open, honest conversation, make sure everything that you're gonna be working with works for you. And um, most employers these days are gonna be at least receptive of that. So, so it's just kind of making sure that you're able to book a little bit of time with either your supervisor or manager and being able to sit down and have a conversation about what's going on and, and maybe providing some solutions at the same time in order to, to be able to be successful in moving forward. So uh, that's that's what I'm hearing anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. And just kind of to reflect on that, Matthias is there. It's uh, the onus of the, the management of the organization to make sure that that's, it's in their interest to make sure it's done. So the onus is on them to make sure it's done. Otherwise they're missing on a lot of opportunity to improve. Mm -hmm. The other piece too, just back to that flexibility, not that we would, um, you know, not that cost, and obviously cost is, is sometimes an issue, but um, the majority of, of the, you know, modifications or accommodations that are made are low cost, no cost. It's just being flexible. It's just the ability to listen and hear and, and make, you know, subtle adjustments sometimes that make a, a world of difference. So that's a message that I think employers need to hear is that just because someone, you know, speaks up to, to say, uh, you know, or to disclose something doesn't necessarily need, mean you need to take out a new bank loan. Um, that's important. Matthias, do you have any examples of how somebody may have asked for an accommodation in, say, like the interview process or um, just, just even before they were hired? Yeah, I mean, it, it would, again, depend on the specific set of circumstances. Um, it's not uncommon for us to do something like, you know, give the interview questions ahead of time. Um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a, you know, a, I wouldn't say a common practice, but that's something we're not afraid to do. Um, you know, in, in other cases, there's an interpreter that's present. Um, we may be attentive to the physical environment based on someone's needs. Um, it, it really runs the gamut. And again, it comes back to speaking to the individual um, and, and making sure it's known that you're able to be, uh, you know, that you're available to have that conversation before the interview. There's nothing, you know, more, um, there's nothing more challenging than going into the interview and then trying to figure out the accommodation. It's nice to be able to get that all prepared ahead of time. Um, but, but someone, if they don't, if they don't clearly see how to do that, they're not going to, they're not, they're probably not going to reach out. And, you know, I, I say that generally, but um, that, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you bringing that up. And uh, I don't mean to focus solely on you at this point, yeah. Matthias, but just as, a, as an employer, um, you know, that that is often in, in a job ad, like if you require an accommodation, contact us. But, yeah. but like, what does that mean for somebody? Do they, you know, do they, 
how do you have that conversation with somebody you've never, like, you're not even, it's so, we talked about how, how personal and vulnerable that is. And now you're calling somebody yeah, or yeah. emailing before you even think yeah. about applying or going for an interview. So, so like, what, what might somebody do to feel a little bit more comfortable or, or what does that look like on the receiving end? As Again, I, I think that comes back to the employer again, where, you know, um, we've got the, you know, this, the, the sort of catch all on the website, you know, here's the number if you need, if you need any sort of modifications for the interview, but then beyond that, it's at each of the touch points. So, you know, if someone is, is screened through, um, then we will send out a confirmation email in that email. It's, it, it gives some direction. We also follow up with a phone call. And during that call, you know, we, we typically will ask that question, is there anything that we should be aware of that may support you during the interview process? again, just trying to reinforce that message that if there's anything we can do to help here in this early stage, this is how you can now reach out to us. And this is the the person who will help you with that rather than the 1-800 call HR number. Yeah. Awesome. And and I really appreciate that. I know that's always kind of a burning question for for people looking for jobs. And Maram, I don't know if you've ever experienced uh, helping somebody through that process or Travis in terms of, of actually just reaching out in that very first very first contact and what that might look like or advice you might have for for an individual who wants to reach out and say I, I would like an accommodation uh, yeah I've actually I've had uh, to work with a previous client who uh, who needed to disclose um, and they were encouraged to disclose before the interview uh, if they if they needed to do that and so I did help them craft out uh, an email uh, outlining uh, what what the disability was and how they could benefit from accommodation uh, uh, in the in during the interview process itself and which turned out very successful. Excellent. Um, when it comes to working with clients one on one, sometimes we talk about common accommodations for what they're facing, what they can actually expect to see. Uh, I can't give them an exact r- a roadmap, but uh, just speak about what I've seen in the past, and usually that gives them a little bit of. Um, peace of mind that hey there are accommodations for this there's other people who have been through this before so just letting them know hey you're not the first and there's already solutions out there usually brings down a lot of that anxiety kind of brings it more to a personal level in terms of like this is you are facing barriers they may be diff- they may be very personal to you but there are also other people who have gone through the same kind of process and they've been very successful and, and been able to to go through this different steps and here's some different ways that it work for them so I, I like that you're able to connect that uh, back to the clients as well that's that's wonderful um, I'm not sure uh, if anybody has anything else they'd like to add I, I know we kind of touched on all of the questions in some capacity Um it's been a great conversation for sure. And, and what I take from it is that, you know, we all have a lot of growing to do still, and, and it is possible to rebuild that trust uh, amongst job seekers and employers. And in order to be able to do that, we just all need to recognize that it's a really important conversation. And on both sides of the party, understand that it's, it's vulnerable. It's a vulnerable situation. And it, it, as uncomfortable as it may be for an employer, it's much more uncomfortable for a job seeker. And it's a lot, it's a lot to, to lay on the line. It's, it's vulnerability, it's fear, it's, it's a lot. So uh, I'm not sure if any, anyone else has anything else to add or not, but I, I do value all of your perspectives and opinions on this conversation. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, not only job seekers, but employers will be able to take some of the things that we've talked about and implement them a little bit more into their into their workplaces as well. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, maybe my lasting comment is that I, I really do think it's a shared responsibility and that employers need to, you know, look in the mirror and even those that, uh, you know, feel like they have already done this or they, you know, they've, they've looked into this, you know, go back and, and you know, uh, reach out to a connection that may be able to, uh, you know, strip down your own biases and, and make those changes. It's a, it's a shared responsibility and we've all got to do our part. Thank you, Matthias. And it's a constant, it's a constant growth thing. I mean, Travis, you, you've talked about that in your own experience and, and how that's changed over the, the last couple of years and, and whatnot, or decades, I guess. And, and it's, it's going to be a continuing, continuing to grow kind of thing for employers and for job seekers. So Matthias, I appreciate you saying like, we've done this, we've been there, but how can we, how can we do it even a little bit better? How can we keep, take it to the next level? And maybe we can't do it on our own. Maybe we need to reach out to another organization just to get a little bit more um, more information that, that we may not have had before. That's wonderful. 
I really appreciate this. Like I said, you, you've all been fantastic. So um, if nobody else has anything to add it, Maram, I couldn't tell if you wanted to say something else or not. <laughs> um, you know, I do agree with everyone else has been saying this whole time, you know, it is a shared responsibility. It is a work in progress, uh, you know, but my message is, uh, you know, for the clients not to give up. Uh, there is hope. Uh, th things are uh, getting better. Uh, with with the work industry, uh, employers are becoming more, uh, you know, more inclusive. They're 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 becoming more open minded uh, to people with disabilities and 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 uh, the terms of disclosure. Um, you know, it and it's just just keep it going, and uh, it's and it's all about finding the right employer uh, and the right skills uh, for you to be able to do that job successfully. Thank you. Maram. And I think that's really important. I'm just going to highlight that little piece you just said. It's, it's right person, right place. And that doesn't go just for the just for the job seeker, but also for the employer, right? They're looking for the right match for them. But more importantly, is it the right match for you? And, and we did talk about that with the values and, and do, do our values line up? So it's it's really important to make sure that we're paying attention to, to the people that we want to spend the majority of our day with. Are they going to be the people that we need them to be? Awesome. Well, again, I really appreciate all of your input today. And uh, um, this conversation could go on for, for hours, I'm sure. And it will be constantly evolving and changing. But uh, so far, you know, we, we've done a, a little bit of good here. And, and I appreciate you all. And on that note, I will say thank you. And we will talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.